Uh, I want to tell you about a few things that we've got tonight that, that just tell you about them. But before I do, I, I need some help tonight. Okay, I need some, I need some folks who, I need a guy who'd like to help me tonight, an adult, okay, just, you're going to go with Miss Cheryl over here, I, I need a, a lady who'd like to help us tonight, okay, back over here, just, just go with Miss Cheryl over there, I just need anybody else who'd like to help tonight, okay, follow Miss Cheryl over there, okay, I didn't say tear the building up, I just said follow Miss Cheryl over here, okay, you guys go with her over here, she'll get you in a minute, while, while they're doing that, out back on the table, we have some books. I just finished, my latest book I just finished is called uh, The Stories Behind Timeless Hymns. My son-in-law started something called Instrumental Hymns in Worship, and he put out a CD that has 22 hymns on it. You can find it on any streaming device. You don't have to buy the CD. You can find it on Amazon, uh, anything you'd listen to music on. If you've got an Alexa or a uh, Google thing, just tell them, play that and they'll play it okay but in here are the stories behind the 22 songs that are on that cd that they put out by instrumental hymns and worship some very interesting songs i i love the old hymns i like new music but i like the old hymns and i love the stories behind them i'll give you just a quick example by the way we have this out back we've got some hardbacks and we've got some paperbacks you can get it all on amazon I think they're about eight ninety nine dollars or something like that on Amazon. You can get the Kindle version. You can buy the paperbacks, and the paperbacks of these are anywhere from $12.99 to $15.99. And the hardbacks are 20, about $25. You can get them from us, $10 for this, $15 for this, and I'll even sign them. Because when you're writing a book, it devalues it. So we'll do that, okay? So the, you can get those out there, all right? Uh, any hardback will be 15 tonight. Paperbacks will be $10 out there tonight. But what are the stories in here, just real quickly? A guy by the name of Edward Scriven was coming home from seminary. He's coming home to get married. He's riding a horse. So this tells you how long ago it was. And he's riding the horse. He goes to cross a creek, and he finds his fiancée laying in the creek. Her horse had thrown her, she's fallen off, and she's died. He's coming home to get married, and he finds her laying in the creek, having died. Devastated him. He left and moved to Canada. While in Canada, a few years later, he meets another lady, gets engaged, and two weeks before they're going to get married, she dies. And he writes back home to his mom, and he says, through all of this, God has taught me something. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. There's some tremendous stories there. And so if you're interested in those, they're out there. Uh, we also have a book. I gave a copy of this to the preacher. It's called Our Five Basic Rules for Life. It's what we've taught our interns for the past 21 years as they have traveled with us. Just basic things that will help you, but they're, they all have a biblical principle to them. And then some of you yesterday heard me talk about the young lady, Danielle, that uh, I met as a fourth grader whose life was all messed up, tried to take her life when she was in the sixth grade. I've only got two copies of this left, but it's out there as well. If you're interested in those, you can stop by and pick those up. I'll tell you about one more thing. We started something about a year. I've been encouraging everybody, go share your story. This is free. This is not going to cost you a dime. You can just go to our website, coolkidsministries.com. When it comes up, there'll be a little yellow box there that says stories. Click on it. You can go in there and it shows you and tells you how to write up your own story. And then you go out, you can, it even shows you how to put it in there. You can do it from a computer, type it all in, hit print, and this thing will come out. Then you can go out to eat and you can look at somebody and say, hey, somebody once shared a story with me that changed my life. Here's my story. When you get a chance, would you read it? They can open up and read your story of how God changed your life. And then the bottom says, if you're interested, open it up. And there's God's story on the sick inside, six words that will change your life forever. And you're sharing your story. It's absolutely free. We don't make anything off of it at all. I just encourage you, share your story. Start telling people what Jesus Christ has done for you. We're in the mess that we're in today, as Pastor was talking about a while ago, because we know the answer to all of life's problems, and we keep it to ourselves. If you take your Bibles tonight and go to the book of John chapter 6, and while you're going there, I'm going to ask if my friends are ready back there to go ahead and make their way out here. And I just want you to meet some folks tonight. 
Maybe. But Cheryl, I'm going to lay these right here. When you get a chance, you can grab those. If you stand right over there, it's Chuck, right? Duck when you have to, Chuck, okay? Uh, if you'll just stand over there. Whenever I look at you, you just squeeze the trigger, okay? Okay, I can do that. All right, just when I look at you, you do that. Step right up here with me. First name is Evan, right? Yep. Okay, step right up over here, right over here. First name is Charlotte. Charla. Okay, I got Evan. How you doing tonight, Evan? Oh, I'm doing good, 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 good. <laughs> good, 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 good. You could say I'm doing good. Awesome. Charlotte, how you doing tonight? <laughs> That's awesome. And Chuck, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm all okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was brought to my attention that you three wanted to sing a song for the entire church tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, something's happened here. He ain't moving no more. What did you do? I don't know. Well, there we go. <laughs> a good at nil. A good at nil. <laughs> so, you're, you're going to sing a song tonight? Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> Have you got a song picked out? I thought we'd do Shania Twain's Man, I Feel Like a Woman. No, no, no. Not in church. We're not going to do that. How about we do a church song? Okay, okay. Can I do it too? Well, yes, you can sing right along as well. Oh, hot dog. <laughs> I guess you want to sing too. Yeah, I want to sing too. Uh. Okay. Well, step right up here with me then. And step right up there. We're all going to... Evan, how about you start us off tonight? Okay, I could do that. How about we sing Jesus Loves Me? Oh, oh, hey, wait, can we do it a special way? You want to sing Jesus Loves Me a special way? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> how do you want to do it? I want to do it American Idol style. You mean we just throw your hands in the air and get into it? Yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> my face says no, but my lips say yes. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Can I do it that way too? Yes, you can. Me too. All right, we'll do it, okay? So, Evan, you start us off. Here we go. You ready? Sure. Jesus loves me, this I know. You don't have to sing. I got you covered here. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my wife. I'm a little slow. Okay. <laughs> Miss Charlotte, it's your turn. For the Bible chills me so. That's good. Little ones to him be long. Wow. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Me. You know, I don't think there's ever been anybody whose voice fits any more perfectly than that one. <laughs> you know, Mr. Steve, what, what's that, Evan? I've always wanted to do something. You have? Uh-huh. And I'm going to do it right here tonight. All right. What are you going to do? Two measures of tap dance right here in the middle of the church. And a one, and a two, and a go. That looks a lot more like river dance than tap dance. Oh. <laughs> Finish this out now. Yes, Jesus loves me. I'll go for it. Hey, 
get one more. Would you guys give them a great big hand tonight, all right? <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one thing to say about Brother Chuck. <laughs> I just love old people. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, they'll kill you. <laughs> Children's ministry kind of reminds me of an old poem I learned when I was a child. It went something like this. Fuzzy wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't Fuzzy Wuzzy. So let me ask you a question tonight. It's the same question that always went through my mind when I heard that poem as a child. What have you done about it? We've got a naked bear on the loose and no one seems to care. So what are we going to do about it? George Barnes said they're more numerous than the entire Hispanic and African American populations of the nation combined. They have more energy than a nuclear power plant and are as confounding as the federal budget. They have tastes as fluid as a river and dreams that will redefine the future. They are a marketer's pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and the most lovable and frustrating beings in the life of every parent. We're talking about America's children. And you don't have to look too far to find them. The Census Bureau reports that there are 74 million children between the ages of 0 and 17 in the United States of America right now, and 31 million of them, are the, or the equivalent of the population of California, are between the ages of 5 and 12. But let's not just focus on America. Our world is growing at an astounding rate. The growth is almost incomprehensible. When we started Cool Kids Ministries over 20 years ago, over 100 babies would be born in the world every five minutes. Let me repeat that. 20 years ago, over 100 babies would be born in the world every five minutes. Today, 20 years later, there are 255 babies born in the world every minute. Every minute. The majority of which will never hear about Jesus Christ. In 1900, 9% of the world's population lived in cities. 20 years ago, it was projected that by 2025, almost 66% of the world's population would live in a city. As of 2023, we are at 60% of the world's population now lives in cities and urban areas. In 2004, there were 23 cities in the world with a population of 10 million or more, and only two of those cities were in the United States of America. It was estimated that by 2020, there would be 27 or more cities that would exceed the 10 million mark. The truth is, there are now 38 megacities in the world today with a population of 10 million or more, and none of those cities are in the United States now. Why am I telling you this? Because you can't have growth without children. It's impossible. It takes children to have growth. And we're talking about millions and millions and millions of children all around the world. And whether you're concerned about their moral, spiritual, physical, intellectual, emotional, or economic development, it is during those crucial years of 5 to 12 that lifelong habits, values, beliefs, and attitudes are formed. The Catholics have told us this for years. They have said, you give me a child until he's seven years old, and I will make him a Catholic for life. I have said that we as Baptists also have one of those sayings as well. And that is, you give me a child until he's seven years old, and I'll make him a Catholic for life. I'll let that slowly sink in on some of you. We're not real good at keeping our children. In America, more children than ever get an early educational start. More than 50% of all three and four-year-olds are now enrolled in school and almost 60% or 66% of all five-year-olds attend all-day kindergarten. However, it's estimated that one-third of all school-aged children are at least one grade level behind in their academic performance. 
It has been reported that poor reading skills are a harbinger of teen pregnancy, criminal activity, poor academic achievement, and dropping out of, of uh, high school before graduation. Most parents in America believe that schools of America do not provide a quality education. However, 7 out of 10 parents surveyed are generally satisfied with the educational quality their children receive. My point? We are quick as a nation to point out all the problems that our children face. We see the naked bear. But we're not willing to do anything about it at all. We're quick to condemn the process by which our children are trained and, nu and nurtured. But what are we willing to do about it when we feel that it comes, falls short? When we changed our Sunday school in Somerset, Kentucky and called it Power Clubs, people were quick to speak out about clubs and not having traditional Sunday school. One man even left our church because we changed Sunday school to the name Clubs and he wanted nothing to do with the word clubs. But no one lined up to be a part of the solution or to come help us make a difference. We had to go out and hunt them and get them involved. And my point is, Christians are just like everyone else, quick to point out the problems, but not willing to be a part of the solution. I don't know who said it, but the reality is true. If you're not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. And for one, I choose and chose to no longer be a part of the problem. I chose to find a way to become a part of the solution. Solomon said it best when he said there's no new thing under the sun. Times have changed, but things have not. People come to church today, but they don't want to see Jesus. It's a social thing or a great place to find a date. People want to talk about religion, but they don't, only, they don't only want to give their opinion. They don't, they don't want to actually get involved in serving God. We're fixated on everything but Jesus. It's not new. Even Jesus dealt with this. People in Jesus' day missed the obvious. They missed Jesus. Instead of focusing on the real issue, people were quickly pointing out picking of grain on Sabbath. Instead of focusing on the top priority, they were fussing about who Jesus chose to spend time with when he hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes. Instead of seeing the big picture, one disciple wanted to talk about the cost of the perfume that one lady chose to use to wash Jesus' feet with. Then here came the children and someone said, get them out of here. But not very many wanted to talk about Jesus. Not many wanted to do anything with the children. I want us to take a brief look tonight at a story and a great lesson to be learned from, of all places, a child. And so in John chapter 6, I want to read to you tonight the first 13 verses. If you'll just follow along, I want you to listen to this story tonight. It says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because he saw his miracles, or because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountains, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the time that we can be in your house, that we can look into your word, that we can allow you to speak to our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us when it comes to children's ministry to get all in. God, I pray tonight that you'd help us to open our eyes and see the need that is before us, not only as a church, but as a nation. God, I pray tonight you'd break hearts and help us to commit ourselves to make a difference, 
not only in this nation, but around the world. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for all you're about to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to notice three short little things about this story tonight. And we'll be finished. The very first thing I want you to see is don't take for granted what children have to offer. In verse 9, we find one of what I think is one of the most haunting phrases in all the Bible. It says, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? How many times have we as adults looked at children and said of the children, what are they among so many? What do these children have to offer? I'll be granted with you, children don't bring a lot of money into the church. They can cost a lot of money from the church. But did you decide to have children because of how much money they were going to bring into your family? Because mine are 44 and 38, and they're still costing me. (laughs) I thought there'd come a day when they'd start paying back. No, it still costs. And I'm starting to have some serious problems and doubts about this uh, taking care of me in my old age. I think they're just going to wait till I can't remember anything anymore and then just stick me back in a corner somewhere every couple of days, toss in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and keep on going. What are they among so many? So many times we can miss out on what children have to offer. Children and youth can bring revival to a church quicker than anything else possibly can. 85% of all folks that come to Christ do so before age 14. Yet that figure only represents 34% of all the people who get saved. Did you know America looks to determine how many prison beds to have 10 to 15 years down the road by how many fourth graders can't read? If you want to change the direction of a boat, you have to start way before the turn. We can't wait till they're adults. We either get them now or we lose them forever. In the United States of America, listen to what I'm about to tell you. In the United States of America, we spend 68 times more money per capita for caring for the average felon than we spend in all the churches combined training our children spiritually. Let me repeat that again. We spend 68 more, uh, we spend 68 times more money per capita caring for the average felon then all the churches combined spend for ministry to spiritually hungry children. That's a problem. Well, we'll invest more money into taking care of a convict than we will spend investing taking a child and stopping them from being a convict. We've got a problem. Did you know that 40% of all children in America go to bed without a father in the home to tuck them in? Did you know that approximately 50% of all children will spend part of their years in a, living in a single-parent home? Did you know that one out of six children in America go to bed every night hungry? Not because of lack of food or money, but because of lack of caring from the adults. Did you know that 40% of all babies born in the United States are born to unmarried women? Did you know that households headed by married couples are now less than 25% in the United States of America? Did you know that 30% of Americans say that drinking is a problem in their home? 17% of children suffer from depression. 22% of children suffer from bullying and cyberbullying. Did you know that the fastest growing age group for suicide is 10 to 14 year olds? Did you know children spend 65% more time on a pornography sites than they do on game sites on the internet? Did you know adult bookstores now outnumber McDonald's 3 to 1 in the United States of America? Did you know that 14% or about one out of seven of all 13 years of all 13 year olds have already had sex? Did you know that two out of every three TV shows contain sexual content? Did you know that the number one wish for girls 11 through 17 is to be thinner? Did you know that 83% of all teens say that the moral truth or moral truth depends on the situation? Did you know that dating on college campuses today is all but obsolete? It's been replaced with a hookup culture where a guy and a girl or others get together for a one-night stand with no connection thereafter whatsoever? Did you know that if every junior high student in America who claims to be gay really were gay, the population of America would already be decreasing? But it's not. Did you know that a person's moral foundations are established by the age of nine? Did you know that a person's theology is shaped by the age of 13 and what they believe is 13 is what they will die believing? 
And did you know that 96% of all parents raising children today do not have a biblical world view? Let me repeat that last one. 96% of all parents raising children today do not have a biblical worldview. Because that percentage is so high, that includes church families too. This is not a babysitting job or a baby, babysitting service so adults can have real church. It's an opportunity to build a saint. It's an opportunity to train a warrior. It's an opportunity to make a difference in the future of America and in the churches of America by investing in children. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3 says, And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, 14, Jesus said, Suffer little children to forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus thought it was important for us to spend time with children. If we don't do something now, the church, from a human standpoint, will be non-existent by the year 2050. We're going to have to start focusing on intensive discipleship on children in our churches. Are there going to be no leaders for the future churches in America, according to Matt Markins, the president of Awana, and the Barner Research Group? We are in trouble. There is a naked bear running amok in America and we're not doing anything about it whatsoever when it comes to children's ministry. So I'm asking a question tonight. What are we going to do about the problem? What can you do about the problem? Don't take what children have to offer for granted. Number two, don't miss out on the lesson to be learned from this child. We talked about this a little bit yesterday with some of the folks. This young lad gave it all. Jesus could have fed 5,000 men plus women and children with three loaves and one fish instead of five and two. Sure, he could have fed all the people there without any loaves or fishes at all. He could have just spoken and it would have been done. But in a sea of adults, Jesus chose to use what a child had to offer. Everything he had. I have an acquaintance, Dr. Rick Cromey. Dr. Rick Cromey grew up in some small town in Colorado. I don't remember the name of the town. He wrote a book called small, a Children's Ministry in Small Churches Throughout America. And he shares a story about his life. The church only ran about 125 people. They didn't have a gymnasium. They didn't have all the fancy stuff that other churches had. But they had a pastor in the church who believed when you went into fourth grade, it was time for you to learn to start serving. And this pastor and a few men of the church would come to children when they went into fourth grade and say, okay, it's time now. You need to start learning how to serve. Rick said, they came to me and they said, Son, you're in fourth grade now. It's time for you to learn to serve. And we've decided that you're going to be working with the ushers. You're now going to be an usher in our church. Fourth grader. He said, I shocked my parents. I went home to my mom and dad and said, okay, they've chosen me to start working as an usher. I need a suit and a tie. He said, my mom about passed out. Fourth grader asking for a suit and a tie. He said, but she bought me a blue suit and a matching tie to go with it. And he said, I'd go to church on Sunday. I was excited. I was now put on the, the rotation to be an usher in the auditorium. But every Sunday, I got to help with something. I got to help count the people sitting in the pews, go up in our little balcony and count how many folks were there. He said, at times, they would take me back and let me help to count the money and fill out the uh, deposit slip. He said, there was times I got to ride to the bank with them and drop off the deposit. Dr. Rick Cromey now teaches. I'm not I, last I heard he was up in Wisconsin at a, a, a theology school up there. I don't know which one. When I first met him, he was at uh, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> Brain just went dead on that one. Uh, Kentucky Baptist schools or something of that nature. Anyway, um, tremendous guy. He said, I, I got ready to... to write a book one day, and he said, I was just looking at some ideas, and I thought, you know what? I want to go back to my hometown, and I want to look at my church versus all the other churches that were in town. And the philosophy that my pastor had, what did that accomplish? He said, so I did. He said, it had been 25 years since I was a kid there in the church. He said, I went back to the church, and you know what I found out? In the 25 years... There had been, or that pastor had been there 25 years. He said, the 25 years that that pastor was there, he said, you know, we had 24 young people in our church who went out of our church and into full-time ministry, either as pastors, missionaries, 
like I was a college professor, a theology professor, 24 out of the 25 years he was there, 24 young people went out into full-time ministry. He said, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool in a small church with only 125 people. And over a 25-year period, 24 go out into full-time ministry. He said, so then I went to every other church in town. Regardless of denomination, I went to every other church in town. Those that had the gymnasiums, those who had all the big stuff to offer to get all these young people in. He said, you know what I found? In all the other churches in town combined, there weren't 24 people in 25 years who'd gone out into full-time ministry. Combined. But because... Our pastor felt that at age, at fourth grade, you ought to start getting involved in ministry. It changed our lives. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. When we start spending some time with some kids and teaching them how to serve, it makes a difference. Jesus saw this young kid and gave him a chance to give his all, and he did. When's the last time you gave your all? When's the last time a child in this church saw you putting it all in and doing what was necessary to make a difference in the lives of people around you? When's the last time, Grandma, Grandpa, when's the last time one of your grandchildren saw you witnessing to somebody? When's the last time your grandchildren saw you kneeling down and teaching them how to pray? When's the last time your grandchildren saw you praying about the things of the church and all that God was doing? When's the last time your grandchildren saw you writing out a check or whatever to make a difference and to give to somebody? When's the last time you taught your grandchildren about sports or fishing or something of that nature? Parents, I can ask you the exact same questions. How much time this past week did you spend shuffling your kids around going to whatever sporting event they had to be to or practice they had to be to? And how much time this past week did you spend telling them about Jesus Christ and reading the Word of God to them or with them? And we wonder why our children are falling out of churches today. Do you know the biggest hole in the church today? We're losing almost 50% of all of our children. It starts in fourth grade and they're gone by the time they reach eighth grade. When I was a children's pastor, I used to graduate out every year 25 to 35 fifth graders out of my children's ministry. Every year. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if you're graduating out of approximately 30 every year. In three years, Evan, the middle school ought to be running a lot. A lot. <laughs> 90. Do you know our middle school never got over 45? Never. We sent them 25 to 35 kids every year, and our middle school never got over 45. And I kept screaming, we're losing them, we're losing them. I spent all these years praying and crying and working with them, and we're sending them into junior high, and they're just, it's, it's, a, it's a black hole. When's the last time you stepped out of the rational into the irrational? I love to see kids get excited about serving God. Last summer, we had a grandmother who brought her granddaughter to a Sunday morning VBS program. Grandma had been out of church for a while. But she felt it was important to bring her granddaughter that morning. And her granddaughter got saved that morning. When we gave the invitation, man, she peeled out, back to the back she went, and one of our interns led her to the Lord. And we have this thing that we carry with us. It's called a cash cube. And we set it up over to the side. It's this great big, it's about 10 foot tall. It's got blowers blowing into it. We throw money and coupons and all kinds of things inside of it. And if you bring a visitor, you get to get in the cash cube. And that little girl's like, I'm getting in the cash cube tonight. And she brought her mom to church that night. And she got to get in the cash cube. But when the invitation was given that night, she turned to her mom and said, Mommy, I got saved this morning. Don't you think it's about time you gave your life to Jesus too? And I have a picture on my phone of that little girl and Mommy and one of my interns sitting way at the back of the gymnasium and that young lady leading her to the Lord that night as well. I love to see kids get excited about it because they don't care. I have a picture that hangs in the stairwell of my office. As you start down the steps, it's right in the front as I'm going down. And a reminder to me every time, if I get a chance to deal with a child at a camp or anywhere of that nature, I want to sit down and talk with them. There was a young lady one night who had come to me after a service and she wanted to get saved. 
And I sit down and talk with them. One of the last things I do is I put the monkey on their back. I'll explain the plan of salvation to them. I have what I call the three stop signs. I teach people all over the place. There's three stop signs when it comes to work, work dealing with children. Stop sign number one, do they understand sin? If they don't understand sin, you're done. You can't get saved from something you don't think you've ever done or you don't even understand what it is. So if you don't understand that first thing, you're done. Stop sign number two for me, okay? Will they ask Jesus into their life? Do they want to do that? I'm not going to force them to do anything. And then I will reach out and say to them, last thing, if you want to pray, I'll lead you in a prayer. I lead everybody in a prayer because I found people pray for everything in the world, but Lord, forgive me my sins and save me. And that's what it's all about. And so I just hold my hand out and say, if you'd like to pray that prayer, I'll lead you now. If you'll just reach out and take a hold of my hand, that puts everything on them. Now they have to make a decision. Am I going to hold this old dude's hand or am I not? And this little girl that night just sat there and looked at me. I said, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you want to ask Jesus into your life? Just reach out and take hold of my hand. And she just sat there. And finally I said, okay, sweetheart. We're at camp all week long. You go have fun. You play. You keep listening. You've got to get a hold of your heart this week. You want to talk to me or anybody else, you just come back and let me know. And she got up and took off. And I'm standing over to the side of the stage. I'm talking with the folks. I don't know if you took the picture that night or not. But I'm standing off to the side of the stage just talking with some folks. I'm probably drinking a Diet Coke or something like that. And all of a sudden, I felt somebody take my hand. And when I looked down, here stood this little girl beside me, tears running down her face. And she just got a hold of my hand. And she's squeezing hard. And I reached down and just picked her up and set her on the edge of the stage. I grabbed my Bible and I hopped up on the edge of the stage and we each grabbed a chair. And there's that picture. Every time I walk to my basement to remind me that there are kids all over this place who still want to get saved. And they're going to have to make a decision and sometimes it's a scary decision. But that little girl that night came back, grabbed my hand, said, I'm ready. We sat down on that stage that night. I went back through it all with her again to make sure she understood it. And that night she trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Amen. Guys, I'm telling you, don't tell me people don't get saved the way they used to. We don't go after them the way we used to. In the past 20 plus years of being on the road, we've seen over 18,000 people step out and walk aisles and trust Christ as their Savior. Kids, moms, dads, a whole shooting match. I was at a camp a few years back and I gave an invitation on a, a Thursday night and a young lady and, a, and, and the adult woman standing next to her in the back stepped out and came all the way down the center aisle and knelt right here. I always tell people, turn to the person beside you and say, if you want to go forward, I'll go with you. I thought... The, the adult lady had turned to her. I found out when the service was over with, the little girl turned to the adult lady and said, if you'd like to go forward, I'll go with you. And the adult lady said, okay. And when they got down to the front and knelt down, the little girl said, what are we here for? And the adult lady said, I need to get saved. Here's the kicker to the whole story. The adult lady was her pastor's wife. And she testified to that camp afterwards. She said, I've been playing games all my life. But when that little fourth grade girl looked me in the eyes and said, do you want to go forward? I couldn't lie to her anymore. A child can melt the heart of adults quicker than anything else. The last thing I want you to get here is don't miss out on the blessings that will come when we start reaching out and ministering to children. Look at verse 13. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained. They gathered 12 baskets full of leftovers. His lunch wasn't just doubled, his lunch exploded. Can you imagine what would happen in this church if you guys would get excited about reaching some kids? Because you know what? The greatest way to reach a mom and a dad is reach their kids. Let's go back to a very basic verse. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? His Son. We've all fallen short of Jesus Christ who was perfect. You want to see the glory of Steve Harney? Let me whip my wallet out or my phone out and start showing you pictures of my kids and my grandkids. I glory in them. Well, God glories in His Son. 
And he glories in the children when we start taking time to share with them what is available to them, what God can do for them. And he blesses churches. I am convinced of it. I've seen it happen time and time and time again. When people start caring about children and investing in them, God pours out blessings. Over the past 20 years of traveling, there have been enough children's stories and letters to keep me going for a lifetime. Some of the greatest things in all are just a smile, just a hug, or just like happened back here this morning, it was all said and done. Everybody's walking out and going, getting ready to go home. I don't know his name, but this little boy walked up to me with his mom, and she goes, he wants to say something to you. And I said, yeah, buddy, what is it? He goes, thank you. I really enjoyed this today. You didn't have to pay me a dime. That did it. That was awesome. Don't take this the wrong way. Just take it for what it is. You know, not one adult walked down to the front after the service was over with back there this morning and said, thank you for today. Now, I had adults come up to me throughout the rest of the time and say, thank you, and boy, we really appreciated you being here. But that young man went out of his way to come down front to look an old 65-year-old man in the eyes and say, thank you. I really enjoyed this today. Don't you imagine that little boy back there on that Judean hillside told everyone for the rest of his life what happened to him that day? Can I ask you a question? What are you doing for God as an individual that children are going to want to talk about you for the rest of their lives? What are you doing that children are going to say, wow, I remember so and so. I remember this guy at our church. I remember this lady at our church. When was the last time you told someone what all God has done for you? I spent the last 20 plus years traveling America and the world trying to be a voice for children, a voice to children, and just being that crazy old man that they could look up to who loved God, who loved them with all of his heart, and who wanted to give them information about how God could give them the very best. So why does children's ministry matter? Because children are a gift from God. Deuteronomy 7 and Psalm 127 tells us that. Children are being specifically taught and trained how to serve God. Exodus 12, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 31, Psalm 78, and Proverbs 22. God wants to have a genuine relationship with children. Psalm 8, Psalm 34, Psalm 103, Malachi 2, Matthew 21, Mark 10, 3 John. God enjoys the nature and personality of children. Matthew 18, Matthew 19, and Philippians 2. You see, God truly cares about children. He wants to touch their lives and He wants to make a difference so they can make a difference in this world and in the lives of all that they touch and come in contact with. So I close with the same question tonight that I opened with. What have you done about it? We've still got a naked bear running around. And he needs some help. There are children all over this community. They need someone to clothe them, feed them, love them, care for them, and most importantly, tell them about Jesus Christ and then spiritually train them for the future. What are we going to do about that? And if the answer is nothing, then we need to get on our knees before God and ask Him to break our hearts for this generation. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. We can still do something. I can't think of a better time to start doing something than right now. I can't think of a better time to start making a difference than right now. You see, in all my travels, I meet a lot of kids. I leave you with a story tonight. I met a little girl. She grew up in an alcoholic's home. Daddy would come home drunk, mean. Many a night, her and her mom and her brother and sister would have to go out and get in the car. There were no shelters in her area. They'd have to drive somewhere and park on a street or park in a parking lot and just sleep in the car because daddy had come home drunk and mean. 
The little girl said we'd go to church on Easter. We didn't go at Christmas time. We'd go at Easter. Mom would get us a little outfit. We'd go. That's it. Nobody ever came and invited us back. She said, I went to one vacation Bible school, but nobody came and invited us back. When she was 16 years old, somebody invited her to church. That 16-year-old girl shared the story about how people at that church cared. And she got saved. She went back on Tuesday night to go out visiting with the church because that's what they did on Tuesday night. And when she got there, they were shocked because they had her card to go visit her that night. She was there. She got involved in that youth department. It wasn't long until she realized she had a responsibility to tell others and she surrendered to ministry. She went off to Bible college. She got married. She became a pastor's wife. This little girl from an alcoholic's home who used to get behind the couch when dad would come home so drunk and cry out, God, if you're real, if you're real, just give me a happy home. This little girl walked into my office one day and said to me, you know, honey, I used to pray God would give me a happy home. She said, I just realized he did. You see, God couldn't give me a happy home when I was a little kid because my parents wouldn't work with him. But today, we have a very happy home. You see, that little girl, that little alcoholic's daughter is my wife. How many Cheryls are waiting out here for someone to come tell them about Jesus, for someone to come invite them back in, for someone to come and tell them, hey, I know life seems like hell out here, but let me tell you what it's like when you give your life to Jesus and you come here. How many of them are waiting for you to finally get all in and say, I'm going to do something? We're not going to let the naked bear stay naked anymore. We're going to do something about it. Because when you finally decide to do that, this community ain't seen yet what God can do through people totally and completely committed to Him. Father, thank You for today. Thank You for the time we've had together. God, I pray that you'd break our hearts. There are children all over this community that need somebody to care. That need somebody to take the time just to love them and share Jesus with them. God, anybody in here could do it. Everybody has a responsibility to do it. Somebody ought to do it. But way too many times, nobody does it. God, help us not to be that way. Help us to be somebody who steps up and says, here am I. Send me. Lord, speak to hearts tonight. And if some people need to get right with you and need to get all in, if some people need to say, God, forgive me, I'm going to do a better job at reaching my grandkids and my kids or whatever, God, help us to start tonight. And we'll praise you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this evening? As the music plays. God, speaking to your heart tonight, just step out and come. And would you do this? Just turn to that person beside you and say, hey, if you want to go forward tonight, I'll go with you. I don't care if it's your husband, your wife. I don't care if it's an adult, you're a child, or a child, you're an adult. I don't care if it's your best friend, your worst enemy, a total stranger. Just turn and ask them tonight. 
If a pastor's wife needs a four-year-old girl, a fourth-grade girl to turn to her and say, hey, would you like to go forward? I'm sure some of you all could benefit from the same. So as the music plays tonight, if God's speaking to you, would you step out and come this evening? stand there and you think about how valuable is a child what is the worth of a child the world knows they have value they're trafficking them they put a price tag on them but to Jesus they're priceless we've got to ask him to give us his heart because what the devil says is for sale God says is not for sale He said he's paid the price. He's bought them back. And he's told us to go and find them. That's our job. We must go and find them. If the watchman doesn't cry out, if we don't go, oh God, forgive us. The joy of heaven is gonna be to look into Christ's eyes. And hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But you have to be a faithful servant to hear that. And that's the challenge. You may be seated. We're going to ask our ushers to come and prepare to take the offering. We want to be able to give a good law for offering tonight. So as the Lord moves you to give, please give. We want to be a blessing to Steve and Cheryl and their ministry. Steve, how many supporting churches do you have? Uh, about, 25. about 25 supporting churches. 
I don't know if you're ready to go into a business meeting, but I would like to go into a business meeting because it'd be nice to have another missionary at Bible Baptist Church, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do we have a motion to go into business? Zach Bowles makes the motion. Seconded by Chuck Hahn. How many would be in favor of taking Steve and Cheryl Harney on for support at $200 a month? Please raise your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone opposed? Amen. So Steve and Cheryl, we're now one of your supporting churches. We're glad you're part of the family. Heavenly Father, I pray that our hearts would be generous tonight. We want to have a part in this ministry that reaches children and then trains people how to reach them. I pray for Steve as he teaches at LBU and the many lives that he can touch. And as they travel, Lord, give him strength. As his legs go numb from teaching, I pray that you would strengthen him, that you would allow him more years to serve you, that you would strengthen them, and that the joy of their life would be seeing children go on to reach other children, to see children grow up into adults that impact the world. Please bless this offering. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Has it been a good day in the house of the Lord? Yes, sir. Yes, all right. Is there a motion to close the business meeting? Evan makes the motion. Chuck wants to second the motion. All in favor of closing the meeting? Look at that. Kim, you're going to dismiss us in prayer. Just holler from where you are. All right, if there's a few men that would help Dave with moving the drums and things out of